So I'm Peter Coleman. I'm on faculty here at Teachers College. I run the Morton Deutsch International Center for Cooperation and Conflict Resolution. And um, one of the areas we work in are long-term, extremely difficult, entrenched conflicts like we are experiencing in the United States right now. If um, the events of the last week that have taken place in Israel and, Ga and Gaza and the political reactions and divisions here on campus, in Washington, across the country have not provided sufficient evidence I'm here to assure you that this country is deeply divided and on something of a bleak uh, precipice. And so we want to give you some ideas, evidence-based ideas today, about how to begin to continue to stand for what you believe in while bringing the temperature down so that we can avoid the worst, right? Because we certainly don't want to tip into more political violence than we are already seeing. So let me introduce my colleague. Pierce Godwin is a um, colleague of mine now for several years and is a founder of an extraordinary organization that he'll probably speak a little bit about. It's, uh, it's, called, it's an initiative called the Listen First Project. Um, and it's a consortium of probably over at this point 500 organizations across the country who are bridge building organizations. So it's a fairly extraordinary thing. I have to say, ironically, the field of bridge building and conflict resolution, uh, the, the various organizations tend to be kind of competitive and territorial. And so somehow, this man has been able to unite 500 organizations that are working in concert to try to you know, uh, uh, complement one another and bring down the heat. Um, so what I, what I plan to do today is start with a little bit of uh, context for the problem. I, I want you to have some sense of the kind of magnitude uh, and the unique nature of the time that we're in. Um, and then what we want to do quickly, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. I'm assuming that many of you have had um, experiences around political alienation in the past several years. Um, but I want to give you some of the facts uh, and then we want to quickly pivot to sort of what to do. Uh, and I'll tell one story that illustrates some of the scientific principles that I've talked about and I've written about. Um, I'll turn to Pierce, and Pierce will also share with you some of the, his insights and experiences in building this coalition and doing the work that he's been doing. Pierce and I co-wrote uh, a series in Time Magazine that was published, I think, beginning about a year ago a series of articles that we'll be happy to share with you, which describe what we're trying to do on the ground and in our own lives. So that's what we hope to share with you. So that makes sense? You with me on this? Yeah? Everybody uh, here and focused? <laughs> OK. So Pierce, I don't think you can see these slides, but I'm going to push them forward if I can. Um, yeah, so that's us, right? That's, you're in the right place? Yeah? OK. <laughs> So again, let me just read this if I can. Today, the United States, and this is from a paper by Pippa Norris, who's at Harvard. It's unpublished. It's just coming out. And she writes, uh, the US is deeply divided into red and blue tribes. Bitter disagreements divide Republican and Democratic members of the party leadership, lawmakers in the US Congress, and at the state level, and grassroots party activists. Um, Sorry, it's hard to see from here. Um, and they're divided on the core issues of the state's role in managing the economy, climate change, health care, moral issues ranging from reproductive rights to gun control, the role of religion in public life, immigration, racial justice, and affirmative action, and foreign policy questions, including what's happening in Israel and Gaza, uh, but as well as US support for Ukraine, uh, the importance of nationalism and disagreements over constitutional rights of rule of law, electoral integrity, trust in the authorities, and the legitimacy of the American democracy. And this is the leadership, right? This is the leadership in our country, not just in Congress, not just in the Senate, not just at the, in Washington, but at the state level and at the grassroots level, that we have these kinds of profound disagreements, not only about the priorities of the country, the most threatening things. Well, no. We actually have agreement on what the most, the biggest threat to the country is. 
overwhelmingly what both sides of this divide believe is that the biggest threat to this country are them, <laughs> the members yes. of the other side, right? Not climate change, gun control, not anything else, right? Disinformation campaigns, it's them, right? Um, but I also want to point out that this is not just something that's happening amongst political elites or politicians, that for about 60 years now, there has been a continuing trend in the US public, which means us, in terms of A, how we feel about the other side. There's increasing animosity and enmity that we feel towards them, and it's continuing to skyrocket. This started in the late 1970s and continues to come to a place where we feel a sense of coldness and contempt for them, right? We are thinking very simplistically about the issues. We sort of follow the lead of our tribe, what they tell us to believe and advocate, and we're not thinking carefully and critically about the differences of the variety of issues and challenges we face. 20-year uh, collapse in identities. So political divisions today are the most divisive identity in the country, but it start, they're starting to cluster with racial differences in those groups and ethnic and religious differences in those groups. So these groups are combining in ways. Um, stark increases in what we call perceptual distortion. There is a huge gap between all of us, our perception of them, their positions on issues, uh, their actions, and where they actually are. I took a, there's a test you can take, it's a quick test called the Misperception Gap Test, put up by Moore in Common. I took this recently. I knew what they were measuring, and I was still 30% wrong on them, right? So most of us really believe that they're much more extreme and kind of coherent than they actually are, and that leads to our own kind of more extreme reactions, which is a self-fulfilling prophecy and a vicious cycle. Um, in times like this, the more extreme voices tend to control the discourse. So in Twitter, about 80% of the content is put out about, by about 10% of the actors who are more politically engaged, which means mostly what we hear is more extreme, right? Which con contributes to our misperceptions. Physically, this is one of the most dangerous trends. Physically, we are moving away from each other. Not just this, the sort from urban to rural, but within cities like this city, you start to see pockets of neighborhoods that are becoming more pure red and or more pure blue as we physically move away from each other. The problem with that, so apparently in the last election, I heard a statistic that something like 90 plus percent of the precincts were either considered now pure blue or pure red, not purple, right? So we're physically separating. And what we've learned from civil wars and civil violence is that those are the conditions where you have large groups of people that live near each other but don't you know, connect with each other at the store, at the gym, you know, in classes. When you have that kind of physical separation, it's much easier to vilify and turn to violence. right? And that is, in fact, what we're seeing. There's a rise in support for political violence today at different levels. Uh, and it's, re it's resulting in something we call stochastic terrorism. What that means is if you have leaders that are talking, and con talking in ways that encourage violence, condone violence, or at least you know, don't mitigate it, don't challenge it, the odds of people who want to be violent or are inclined to be violent increases. And there, the probability of them acting out increases. That's what they call stochastic terrorism. And this is what we're seeing. So threats against our local librarians, uh, you know, city hall members, uh, mayors, uh, school board members has is increased so, so that most of them are feeling one of these things, right, over the last year. This is recent. Hate crimes in this country are at a decade high and continuing to escalate. This is targeting various members of different groups, marginalized groups particularly in big cities, we're seeing spikes in hate crimes. Um, and this is the most scary thing. I have to, you know, I've said a few scary things. This is the most. So this is a book by Barbara Walter, who's a, a political scientist, uh, but who also works for the CIA as an analyst. And what she does is study instability in countries around the world. And they've been applying their algorithms, their, you know, methods to understand political stability here. And she argues that we are 
on the brink of a civil war. She says that it's not going to look like the 1850-60 civil, civil war, where you had you know, groups on a field with muskets and different uniforms. What it is going to look like is what happened last Christmas Day. M many people don't know this, but last Christmas Day, across five states in this country, there were multiple attacks on power substations by mil militant groups. So they basically went into the power substations and communities, took them out with munitions in order to destabilize the government, so anger and frustration in the rest of us, and start to mobilize chaos. That's how she sees the next war taking place, is not as organized armies, but as cells across the country. And we're seeing more and more of this, an increasing rise in this. So this is the problem, right? This is the state we're in. We are more polarized than all of these other regions of the world. Polarization is ticked up elsewhere, but we are the most extreme in this country right now. Some of you may know, but our democracy is oftentimes graded, and we were downgraded recently to a flawed democracy because of the lack of kind of support that we have for each other and these huge divisions. Um, so this is a bad time, and it's a bad runaway train we're on, right? Um, most of us, many of us, are very concerned about the, ne the next political cycle and the itinerant violence that is likely to come with that, whatever the outcomes. Um, and unfortunately, our political leaders are very constrained about what they can do. Uh, during the last uh, election, Biden was elected, his transition team contacted me and sort of said, you know, Biden wants to do a program on uniting the country, what can he do? And after I assessed the situation, I said, not much. He's, he's seen as you know, a false leader, as a thief to half the country. So if he does a program, yeah, half of us will show up, but that's not gonna work, right? What I said is you, what you can do is not make things worse and you can implement programs which can address some of the underlying grievances, but you can't really directly unify, unite this country because you're at the epicenter of the problem, right? The good news is we can. We can do this. And so what Pierce and I and many of these other organizations have been trying to do is mobilize a social movement, an awareness of the magnitude of this problem, the seriousness of this problem. Some of America's best historians, John Meacham, Doris Kearns Goodwin, are really seeing direct parallels between the 1850s and today, that we are in a place where that level of violence is more and more possible. And so this is something to take very seriously and to take personal responsibility for. So that's what we want to talk about. So let me ask you two questions. That was a lot of bad news, right? So let me ask you, have you in the last few years, if I could see a show of hands, become alienated from somebody that you used to not be, a family member, a, a neighbor, someone that you work with? Let me see a show of hands. Have you sort of stopped talking to people? That's about half of us, that's about right, maybe a little bit more, right? So there is this alienation, and you know, oftentimes our tendency is to just step away from those, and that makes sense. Um, but it you know, contributes to our sense of loneliness, which is an epidemic in this country, and disconnection. Um, and it is part of the problem. Um, so part of what we want to encourage is that we think about what could we do instead of disengaging. The other question I want to ask is, how many of you are just exhausted with this whole political mess? We are in such a mess, right? Oh my, you know, it's just like unbelievably exhausting. And again, here the good news is that you're not alone. This is from last month. This is a Pew uh, poll. And basically 90% of people in America say the same thing. We are fed up, exhausted. We don't want this anymore. We want something different. The way they describe politics today is, Corrupt, chaotic, polarized, divisive, messy, disgusting, sad, you name it, right? And, and, and S something IT, right? That's how they see the government, the majority of Americans. That's good news. Why? Because it means that there is a ripeness in most of America right now for something different, for pivoting. Um, and one of the things we study are our societies that had either experienced a civil war or were on the verge of a civil war and at some point stopped and pivoted and a and, and mass public decided to take a different path. 
And so that's what we want to talk about today is what that looks like. What we find is that in the study of these societies, three things matter. One is that you have enough people that are just miserable and want a different path. Two is that enough people feel destabilized by the status quo and just think of COVID, racial injustice, you know, everything, our politics. There's a tremendous instability. We've seen it in the great resignation that's happened in the last two years where something like 100 million people have voluntarily left their job out of 130 workers, right? Have voluntarily said, I don't wanna do that anymore, I wanna pivot. Well, we could do the same thing politically because of the you know, disillusionment. But we need to know what, that, what the alternative looks like. That's what we wanna pivot to. So if I can, uh, and that's what, so I wrote this book, published in 2021, to, to basically offer you five ideas that come from evidence-based research about how you today could start to pivot and what that would really look like in your life. And so I wanna share that by telling a story. If I can, I'm gonna sit down, if that's okay with uh, everybody, so that I'm kind of with Pierce, um, <laughs> okay? Um, I wanna tell a story which is about a walk. So, uh, and had we had a different circumstances, I would have encouraged all of you to do this before we talked about it, but we're gonna, I'm gonna encourage you to do it afterwards. Um, and this is just a story about how I took what I'm preaching seriously in my life. So about a year and change ago, uh, the book had been out for a year, and I really said to myself, you know, I have to l figure out how to live this in my own life. How do I do that? And so I thought to myself, who do I feel estranged from? Who have I stopped communicating with? And there were a few people that came to mind, but there was one person in particular who lives in my building. He's a man I've known for 15 years now, um, sort of just casually, but I've seen him with his children and his grandchildren, and you know, we've chatted through the years. But a couple of years ago, he started to share his politics with me, and I thought he was insane. The things he was saying, I just couldn't fathom. And so, you know, a, a year plus ago, I said, okay, I'm out. I just, you know, I felt like he was trying to be provocative and bait me, and I just didn't want to engage. So I really just walked away from the relationship and the conversation, stopped talking to him. But then, you know, last summer, I thought, I can't do this. I have to somehow figure out some way to keep the conversation going. So maybe I need to kind of walk my talk, literally, and figure out how to do that. So I emailed my neighbor and I said, um, would you be willing to take a walk with me in the park? So he, it was about a day before he responded and then he came back and said, yeah, I'm happy to you know, sit down with you and have a conversation, but like, why walk? Like, what's that about? Are you CIA? Is there surveillance? <laughs> like, what's going on? This is something he asked me about three or four times, so it was a serious concern for him. Um, and I said, no, you know, there's a, there's a reason behind it. I'll explain it to you, but if you would be willing, let's take a walk. So he agreed, we met, and I want to say a couple things about that. So the first thing I had to do is say, like, what am I doing here? What, what's the point of this? And what do I want to see happen? So many times these days, we just launch into conversations unwittingly, find ourselves triggered, outraged, saying ridiculous things that maybe we wouldn't usually say. It's very easy to get sucked into that. So sometimes, if you can be intentional, it's really important to stop and say, what do you want to do here? I, we could have easily, he and I could have easily gotten into some stupid conversation that went nowhere and exploded. But that wasn't the point of this. The point of this was to try to, here was someone that had very different political values and attitudes than me that I could learn from. So I thought, I need to try to figure out how to listen to this person. So I intended to do that. I will say, so I'm a mediator and a peace builder and I've worked in this field for 30 years. I was very nervous. <laughs> I was like sick to my stomach nervous before I met him, right? It's, it's hard. These are hard encounters. But we met. He too was nervous. He immediately said to me, you know, I, uh, my wife isn't feeling well, so I may have to cut this short. You know, I said, fine, that's cool, whatever it is, let's give it a shot and see where we can go. So we took a walk. Second thing I did was think about how to start this. 
And so we started this not on politics. I started this by saying, who are you? Tell me where you're from. What's your background? Where, did, where, where were you raised? Give me some sense of who you are. And, and that was fantastic. It was really interesting. He you know, was born in south of France. His grandfather was a very important rabbi down there and established uh, you know, temples there. And, so he, and then he lived in London, and now he's here. His family's all over the world. So he gave me this sort of context of him, and it helped me understand him and understand his values and his politics because I started to understand how his values and his community's values were really aligned with a lot of the political positions that he had. So it opened me up to understanding him as a human, and I, I then told my story. And he, too, was surprised by some things and learned some things. And we found some things in common. And then we continued to walk. And at some point, he said, uh, so like, you know, tell me what's, what the deal is here. Why did you respond to me? I assume I'm the only Republican you know. And I said, no, that's not accurate. He said, I'm, I'm probably the only Trump-loving Republican you know. And I said, well, that's fair. <laughs> yeah, <you know. laughs> and so, and then I said, which is important, and again, this is kind of an evidence-based strategy. I said, can you explain to me like, why you support this approach to politics and support these positions? Can you explain that to me? So then he launched into what I would say would be a 20-minute, 25-minute you know, sort of tirade, talking points, Breitbart, you know, Fox News talking points about the, the real ills of society most of which I totally disagreed with. But I didn't take the bait, I didn't challenge, I just listened. And I would ask clarifying questions, so your community accepts this but not this? Okay, that's interesting. And just listened. And what happened is as we walked, right, so we're walking physically outside, side by side in a park. And the more he talked, the faster he walked and the more pressured he became. But in some ways, what happened is there was a kind of wave of intensity that he rode and then came out of. And at some point, because what was happening was not what he expected, which was that I was going to challenge him and debate him and you know, he would debate me, that didn't happen. I listened. And he then kind of came out the other side by identifying some of his own inconsistencies and doubts about his candidate and some of the choices that they've made. And maybe this was a bad idea, and we probably shouldn't do this again. So he started to come to his own more nuanced understanding. He'd kind of stepped off of the talking points and got into his own you know, ambivalence about some of these things. And in doing so, he kind of opened up my heart, right? Because suddenly, he's not just you know, good and evil. It's more complicated than that. I now have a sense of him, and I have a sense of his own ambivalence about his politics. And so about now, we're heading back towards our building. I said, I know your wife is not well. We should probably head back. And he said, ah, we can walk a few more blocks. <laughs> <laughs> so we walked a few more blocks, got back to the building. I had left a copy of my book, The Way Out, for him there. Uh, when I got there, I handed it to him and said, this is, you know, give you some explanation as to why I asked you to do this. You do not have to read this book. But we got in the elevator together. He looked at the back of the book, and he said, yeah, political polarization. He said, what a mess. We are just in such a mess right now. And he said, you know, you, you're in the forest all the time. You're just in the woods, and you don't really know how to respond. You're just reacting to what you can. But he's like, I, I don't know what to do about this. And I said, well, I think all we can do is what we just did, which is to try to have a decent conversation where we can learn a bit about each other and keep that conversation going. And so that's basically the story. The postscript is that about two weeks later, my son, who was about 27, got on the elevator with this man. They had never spoken before in 15 years. Um, but the man looked at him, my son and said, oh, you're, you're Peter's son. And, and he, my son said, yeah. And he, he was nervous. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and he said, tell your father that I'm reading his book, and it ain't bad. <laughs> and I thought, that is the best endorsement I have for this book, right? <laughs> you know, undoubtedly. So 
What I'm trying to illustrate here quickly before I turn to my colleague and have him share some of this is that this is a big problem. This is a vortex that is drawing us in. It's a, it's a complicated problem, this degree of what we call toxic polarization. It's an addiction. And so what we try to do is identify these five things which make a difference. That if you're going to engage, you want to, do, you want to stop and do it intentionally. You want to think about what you're doing and, tr and try to prepare, prepare yourself. And we'll suggest some resources that can help you with that. The next thing you want to think about is like, how do I do this and who do I know that does this well? Is there somebody in my life that actually is really good at this and what do they do? Um, or are there other groups and organizations that Pierce will talk about that I can turn to to maybe help me learn how to better do this? The third thing is that you want to complicate your understanding of everything. In me saying to him, who are you? And him telling me his story and vice versa, it wasn't just a, a Trump lover. It was this complex person, right, who has values and struggles. Uh, and that changed my experience of him and I believe his of me. The, third, the fourth is very important is movement. One of the things we've learned from neuroscience is that it's good to physically move if you feel stuck, if you feel emotionally stuck, cognitively stuck, even just getting up by yourself, putting on some bad music and dancing like a mad person in your room, great, right? It helps sort of shift things up. But more importantly, moving side by side, outside with someone who you disagree with and having a conversation is a very fundamentally different physical experience than sitting across the table from someone. So consider that as a secret weapon, as, some, as one way to loosen things up is to invite people to move together with you. And then the final thing I'll say is that, did this solve our problem? Of course not. But we've continued to have conversations. We've met again. We send each other articles. Most of them you know, trigger me, but you know, they go, we go back and forth. Um, and we've continued to keep the conversation going. This is a, a very difficult long-term problem, and there are not simple fixes for this. So we have to recognize that we, we have to be in, the long, um, in this for the long run, right? So Pierce, let me turn to you. We, we, Pierce knows this story well. We've talked uh, quite a bit, and as I said, we co-authored something. I want to I out us, if I can, just quickly, because so I, I don't know this may surprise you, but I tend to lean more progressive, right, and kind of more secular and scientific. Pierce leans a bit in the other direction. So we're uh, an interesting couple for that reason. Um, but, have, uh, but I think we share a sense of humanity and value that really connects us uh, and, a, and a concern about the country. Um, so Pierce, with that, can I tee, tee up your experiences and your recommendations? Of course. Thank you, Peter. And what an honor to be here with you all today. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, Peter, you beautifully articulated the problem. And I think it's something we're all feeling. And to underline the point you just made about the pair uh, we offer into this conversation, my moment as I've come to think about it. We've all, you know, perhaps if you think about your own lives, had this moment where it's not that any of our convictions or our passions for a given issue or a given solution are diminished, but it's that we realize there's something more fundamentally broken, right? What the hell is going on? at my family's dinner table and in my workplace. And for me, that moment came after working for four years in Republican politics in DC, voter micro-targeting, and then going over to Uganda, Africa for six months with a Christian International Relief Organization. So there you go, Republican, Christian. There's my side of the coin that, that Peter and I offer. Uh, but I realized in mid-2013, which, you know, if we had a time machine, those are quaint days um, in some sense relative to where we are now and what we're fearing in the months and years ahead. But even in 2013, with that distance and with really what's kind of a, a great example, an extreme example, uh, but an example of what Peter and I are encouraging ourselves and everybody to do, right? Step outside your comfort zone a little bit, get around people that are unlike yourself. Certainly suffice it to say your conservative white Southern boy here did that in Uganda, Africa. And I was so struck, of course, by some of the terrible abject material poverty over there, but there was this relational wealth I mean, the social capital, as some of our friends call it, was through the roof. 
Uh, and I don't know what I'd be doing today, but it, it may not be this if I didn't have that time and space to look back at home, at this country that I deeply love, and say, wait a second, what am I coming home to? And I wasn't going back to D.C. I was going back to, to where I am now in North Carolina and saying, hold up, in the most materious, materially prosperous nation on the planet, we're at each other's throats. It's this abject relational poverty, right? This direct juxtaposition of what I left over there, seeing folks at each other's throat at a fever pitch and saying, this is, this is crazy. What, what are we doing to ourselves? What am I doing to my fellow Americans? And certainly in the months and years since, uh, we're all feeling it more and more. And as Peter articulated, you know, what I find in talking to folks across the country and reflecting on my own relationships is that Americans are tired of division and dysfunction. You know, when we take a second, I think we realize we want peace in our families. We want calm in our communities. We want unity in our country. And we want solutions to our problem, right? Whatever that thing is that feels stuck and feels so dangerous and threatening, um, I want forward movement on that thing. I want to find a way forward together. I want to find a way out of that paralysis. And the good news, as Peter already talked about, and that we're here to, to leave you with ultimately, is that even as that personal pain and national fear that is caused by this toxic polarization increases, so too is momentum for the way out, right? So too is momentum for bridging divides, for going towards what we think of in the bridging divides movement of social cohesion and collaboration. Uh, you've already heard me say it once and I'll underline it. In the national message testing we've done, there are a few weirdos out there like me who wanna listen first to understand and expand our horizons and meet a stranger. Um, there aren't enough of us to change the country, but by and large across segments, Folks want to work together to fix things we broadly agree are broken. And that's where not only the connecting, not only the dignity, but actually working together, rolling up our sleeves, finding those common values, and getting something broken fixed uh, can bring more people to the table. So there is hope, right? There is opportunity with, as Peter already mentioned, these hundreds of efforts that in their own way are bringing folks together to turn down the heat and find that way Forward. Just real quick background on that. I'm going to share everything that, that I had in mind here, and then I want to leave a lot of space for other things Peter wants to share, and then Q&A and hearing from you all. So just very briefly, you know, this field of what I would humbly consider very patriotic Americans concerned about toxic polarization destroying this country has just exploded, right? I come back from Africa, and I have absolutely no idea what I'm doing. Peter knows what he's doing. I have no idea what I'm doing. But I was so encouraged to realize that I wasn't alone, right? Even in 2017, a few years after that overnight bus ride in Africa, when I jotted down some frustrated thoughts, I realized there was something called the Village Square down in Tallahassee. There's something called Living Room Conversations. And oh my goodness, there's a National Institute for Civil Discourse. Okay, cool. Like, imagine if we could work together. And, and Peter already made a, a very uh, uh, shrewd comment about the irony that we uh, can find in the bridging divides field. Um, but I've been grateful that as the problem has increased, so too, I think, has all of our humility, realizing that it is bigger than what any one person or any one organization might tackle alone. And as Peter mentioned, we've gone from four organizations to now over 500. That is the known bridging divides field. But another note of hope, I think Peter and I would agree, and he's cataloged so many as well, there's probably hundreds more that we've never heard of. Right In communities across America, in neighborhoods across America, where people are feeling that personal pain, that national fear, and they're doing something about it. They're having that patriotic reaction to say, you know what? No, I'm going to take that person down the hall out for a walk. I'm going to have that courage. I'm going to be the change, if you will, uh, for this problem. And indeed, every year, especially around this annual National Week of Conversation that we've done since 2018, we're discovering more and more of those efforts. And we'll do that again this coming April and hope you all would be a part of it. But I think it's the fifth time now probably I've said hope, right? That is the key. Uh, and, and Peter spoke to this scientifically as well. If I'm just convinced that there's, there is no way out, um, then I, I'm not gonna do anything uh, productive. Uh, I'll, I'll quickly uh, tell you the kind of reactions I've gotten to, to folks who say, you know what? Oh, hell no. Not that guy down the hall uh, that I'm pretty sure uh, believes X, Y, and Z. There's no way. And I just want to ask people, and I have asked folks many times very earnestly, what's the end game? 
right? What, how does this end? Can you play this out for me? Um, and I think many of us, either consciously or unconsciously, uh, tend to think, you know what? We're going to win that next election. We're going to win that next competition of ideas and values. And somehow we are going to vanquish them. We're going to vanquish them and not have to contend with them anymore. We're going to win. Uh, and in all humility, in the great pluralistic diversities that is the U.S., I think that's delusional. Um, or to the point of folks who are just giving up. And look, I get it. I've been tempted to plenty of times to say this food fight up here is too much. I'm just going to hunker down with my friends, my closest family. Um, you know, we're going to duck. And I don't think that's how we solve the problem either. Um, and then, of course, we have lots of stats. I'm not going to scare you any further. Peter already did that enough. Uh, but convinced that we're going to have a civil war, that we're irrevocably destined to this kind of terrorism and civil war. I'm not signing up for resignation to that doom. Uh, and then finally, all these folks have a literal plan to leave. They're going to dash, right? So delusion, doom, duck, and dash. They're going to leave the country. Peter and I are here saying there is a way out, and we're not giving up on it. And that hope is found in Americans of all backgrounds and beliefs crossing these lines of difference, just like Peter did, to spend a little time together, to see humanity in each other, to identify shared values and to work together to fix things we broadly agree are broken. Um, and I'll pause, I've gone on long enough, but happy to share some of you know the very humbling uh, realizations I had myself. You know, it's easy to think, hey, you know, we, we work in this, we're leading the charge, and then Peter comes up with this political detox challenge and I do it and I say, oh man, I'm as big a part of the problem as the next person. <laughs> I'm happy to share some of that uh, if helpful. Um, in addition, before we part here to some specific things that I highly recommend across you know, the heroic organizations doing this kind of work and building this movement. But that's enough for now. Pierce, thank you. That's fantastic. I so appreciate your energy and earnestness and enthusiasm to this work and the commitment to this work that you've shown. Um, Pierce, mention, I'm going to mention a couple of resources, and then we want to open this up to questions. I imagine you all have questions for one or both of us, um, but I want to point to two resources. So Pierce talked about the Listen First Coalition. They have a website. The organizations are all listed there. Um, there's also a website that I would recommend, which is put out by Princeton University. It's called the Bridging Divides Initiative. And what that offers, what they've been doing over the past several years is finding community-based organizations that oftentimes rise up, usually because of local community issues like you know, race relations in Richmond, Virginia, right, the epicenter of slavery. Um, and these organizations, which is, that group is called Hope in the Cities, they rise up in local places, they start to effectively address some of those challenges and then as other issues like political divisions come in, they start to support that work. This, if you go to this website, it's a map of the US, you can toggle in to your county, to your city, and you can find, you know, in New York City, there are dozens of organizations that support bridge building work, um, but this is across the country. It's all of these groups and organizations. So I would strongly encourage you to do that because these are well-intentioned groups that are doing something right because they come up to address problems and then they're somehow able to sustain. There are, I think, to, to date, something like 8,000 of these groups across the country. So that's the good news, is, is there are those kinds of supporting, supportive initiatives. And then Pierce mentioned quickly, I want to point to this um, thing, which is the, what we call the Polarization Detox Challenge. So what we realize is that the, Meeting people at a dinner, at an event, and having conversations across the divide is very challenging for some people, time intensive, a little demanding. So we wanted to offer something that's a little, um, has a lower threshold of resistance, and this is this challenge. On Monday, we're launching this version of it, which is a new version of it. And it is, um, basically encourages you to sign up Every day for over a four-week period, we send you an email or text and then a link. And it's a link to different kinds of exercises that you can do to start to think about your own contributions, your own tendencies and habits that may be shutting you off from a different point of view. Your own in-group, right? Your, the, 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 our in, the, the, what has happened more and more is that we are not honest with people on our own side. 
our capacity, our comfort being honest about our own ambivalence, as my neighbor was, with our own group is really diminished. We've tightened up on, on all sides of this issue. So how do you begin to reintroduce some kind of nuance or tolerance within your own group? Then how do you find organizations and places to reach out across? The third week is about reaching out across the divide. And the fourth week is trying to find these organizations that are working on shared concerns in the country. They're all over the country. Red and blue Americans are coming together to do things like build homes for the poor, right? So what are those organizations and how do we find them? So it goes from me to my in-group and the challenge is there to how do we reach across constructively and then how do we move to start to address some of the broader issues together. And it is it little as five, five minutes a day. You get an email and it will say, try this. It can be more if you have more time and energy for things, but it gives you three options a day over four weeks to change. And again, it's, it's, just a, it's not a talk, it's not a TED talk or a book, it's really just a nudge every day. And it's a way to build kind of new habits and new thoughts and attitudes that, not only, that transcend you, but go to your own group and encourage you to reach out and build a, a broader community. So, you know, this is all there, it's all part of this what we see as an opportunity of this crisis. I think it's Rahm Emanuel that said, he probably stole this from somebody else, but mm -hmm. said, you know, never waste a crisis. And we are in a serious crisis in this country around the world as well, but in this country right now, we are in a political crisis. And so it is an opportunity for us to recalibrate, rethink, reset, and pivot. Um, and, and we encourage you all to join us in that. But if I can, if I will, let me open this up to questions to both of us. Um, if you have them, please go to the microphone so that people on Zoom can hear your question. But we're, <clears throat> we're interested. Do you have, the, you've got to have questions about this. I would. <laughs> Looks like we have a taker. Hi. Hello. Okay, so question. Who, just tell, who, who are you? Oh, sorry, Morgan Matthews. Hi. I graduated in 2023, spring of 2023 Got it. Uh, with the Organizational Psychology Change Leadership Program, so yep. Yep. familiar with you. Yep. Uh, <laughs> so my question is uh, following affirmative action. A lot of Fortune 500 companies are changing things around. Yep. Um, for example, like getting rid of chief diversity officers. Yep. And then my company, we had a discussion with a couple of law firms that suggested do's and don'ts when it comes to internal programming. Yeah. So my question was um, depolarizing group conversation. So you mentioned, uh, Pierce, I think you mentioned things are, it shows that things are broken. But in my opinion, that doesn't necessarily mean that titles will stop something. So for example, a lot of organizations are changing CDO to chief equity inclusion officer, yeah. just taking the diversity out of it, which yeah. is, in my opinion, silly. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> based on all that, just curious in terms of, I think everyone knows something is broken, but what are your thoughts in terms of like having those group conversations in a workplace where some are afraid to use it just because of the lawsuits that have been happening, but they know yep. there still needs to be that change. Yeah, great question. Pierce, do you want me to start or would you like to jump in? Please go ahead. And I've got a couple <laughs> examples of corporations who are, uh, I think, doing a great job and leading the way. So um, one of the things I want to, I will send you afterwards and make available to people is a, is a, um, an, a an op ed that I I'm about to uh, co publish with uh, Allegra Chen Carell, who's a former doctoral student of ours. And we've worked on diversity, equity, inclusion for a long time, and we've just written a piece in this current context, what do we do? Like, how do you move forward, even with all of the legal, cultural challenges and backlash that's happening? Um, and I, I think in, your, in the earlier session, I'm pr pretty sure you asked a question about this as well, right? Yeah. I love questions. Yeah, yeah good. <laughs> um, and, and so part of what uh, that piece will, talks about is what do you do under these circumstances, right? If, there's, if leaders are wary because of lawsuits uh, that are being um, you know, focused on any kind of diversity program, what can be done? And we, we point to two things. Um, 
One is uh, what you referred to earlier is like, you know, employees that are what we call tempered radicals. People that are within an organization, within an institution that, you know, appreciate the institution and know it needs to change. I feel that way about Teachers College in Columbia, right? A lot of problems here, well-intentioned group, but still needs, still has a long way to go on our road, right? Mm -hmm. So, and how do you do that? And one of the studies that uh, a group of our students did over the past couple of years is study what, what actually do people do that are trying to reform from within, um, and especially if they're at risk, if they're new employees, if they're people of color, if they're women, if they're of more vulnerable status within an organization, how do you do that work without getting you know, called out or singled out or fired, right? And what this group found was a, a constellation of things that happen in organizations that do this effectively. It's not just direct activism and advocacy. Some of us can do that. White guys can do that because we're protected largely, right? If, as long as you don't break the law, although that's a whole other issue. I don't know. But there are other uh, uh, roles that are played in institutions that are keeping the fire burning. Mm. And they include mediating. So it includes people that are willing to bring the parties together to have constructive conversations about what else do we do now? What does this look like now? I know the Teachers College has, has a committee right now looking at this very carefully and seriously. Given the legal constraints, how do we move forward in ways that are respectful and inclusive right. and consistent with our values? So finding a problem-solving approaches to that that are not necessarily direct advocacy but are about problem-solving. And then two other things. One is, and these are more what we call uh, below-the-radar strategies. One is resistance. Resistance can stay alive, right? It can still be something. It may not be a direct thing that people do, but there may be things that you choose not to do anymore in an organization unless it supports you. And the other, which was surprising to me, is what they call healing. This work, DEI work, diversity work, inclusion work, particularly under the cir current circumstances, is extremely difficult, exhausting, high burnout, and can be toxic. So there are many people within organizations that recognize that and try to find ways to support and encourage. It might be breathing techniques. It might be encouraging people to take a walk, uh, you know, and identifying things that they shouldn't do or go, shouldn't go to that may be triggering. But it is like, how do you care for the activist community in a way to protect them and build resilience and capacity so that they can continue under these times? So I'm, I'm not sure if that exactly addresses your question because I'm talking at more of a kind of micro-organizational level. Um, but I do want to say that there are institutions like this that I think are trying to take these challenges seriously and within the constraints of the current laws, find ways forward. Pierce, you want to add anything? Yeah, very briefly. You know, the, the one space that, that still tends to defy some of what Peter outlined is the workplace, right? We're more likely to find ourselves proximate to people who look differently, think differently, vote differently than we do. And so certainly the temperature is very hot, as we all know, in the workplace right now. And, and you know, to your point uh, in the question, uh, I love the tip to suspend judgment and extend grace. And I, and I dare say a few other people, are pretty bad at that uh, these days. And so it's risky, right? It's risky to even have those conversations. Uh, you know, we've partnered with a number of organizations behind National Week of Conversation and Meeting of America, the field's big moonshot, you know, Walmart, Target, McDonald's, Harley, Dick's Sporting Goods, Boston Beer, Petco. And even in using, you know, some of our, uh, those employees as guinea pigs, frankly, for, for the programming, they said, you know what, there might be a colleague from my company, I won't name it, here, and I might get fired for saying the wrong thing. So we, we've gotten stifled and fearful, and, and, and sadly, I think, for good reason uh, in many ways. But I do want to credit and acknowledge that there are business leaders out there, shout out Dick Sporting Goods, um, for really doing a tremendous job of pulling together you know, what they cutely call their teammates, um, who span uh, many different perspectives and having these intentional conversations, giving each other grace, giving each other that, that space uh, to uh, be honest and, and to not fear 
uh, a persecution or condemnation, uh, but to really connect as human beings. And we've got to do that in the workspace. And again, in some ways, it's, it, it's uh, I don't want to say one of the last frontiers, but one of the ripest opportunities to, to uh, for where it's more convenient and accessible to find somebody who might have voted differently in the last election. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you both. Thank you very much. Please follow up with me because I'd be happy to I share. Wrote down okay, great. Very good. Very good. We might have a coffee chat. Okay, very good. That sounds great. Coffee's on me, or maybe on TC. <laughs> yes, go ahead. Hi, good morning. Hi, Peter, and hi, hi Pierce. Thanks for this incredibly- Just introduce yourself if yes. you can. Yes, uh, Stefan Spilkowitz, also a graduate of the Executive Masters in Change Leadership Program, yep. uh, class of 2020. Uh, thanks for holding this incredibly important and timely conversation. Um, so I was curious to know, what are your thoughts as to how do we de-escalate at the systemic level to be able to have these depolarizing con conversations when we have so much uh, emotional and psychological entrenchment yeah. at these diametrically opposed opposites. How do we, how do, we do that pre-work of de-escalating to say, okay, let's have a conversation, let's learn more about each other? Sure, let me just ask for clarification. When you say at the systemic level, do you mean leadership, like government, government officials? What do you mean systemic level? Well, I, I mean just uh, groups that are diametrically opposed. You yeah. know, I'm thinking Democrats and Republicans. I'm yeah. also thinking of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Yeah. Um, groups that have history of that entrenchment. Sure, sure, sure. Happy to do that. Pierce, do you want to start? Do you want me to? I would, uh, please go ahead. I'm thinking, Peter, about the gentleman who called into our hour on C-SPAN and said we knew nothing about human nature. Um, but why don't you give it your best shot, buddy? Yes, we did a C-SPAN re recently where there, it was a colorful conversation. Um, so, um, so I want to say that in my book, The Way Out, which I'm going to plug shamelessly, <laughs> the first story I tell is, a, I think, a, a, a um, compelling anecdote and sort of symbol of what's possible. And it's a story of um, Boston in the 1990s when there was a horrible shooting in Brookline, Massachusetts, which is a suburb of Boston. Um, of two women's clinics, people were killed, people were wounded, it was atrocious. It really destabilized Boston, the US. And it was in Boston, which is 36% Catholic. Abortion was very important, very salient, and both sides of activism there were filled with extremely hostile, provocative rhetoric. So this terrible thing happens. And you know everybody's just lost. Um, and one of the things that was a, react, a response to that was that there was a group called the Public Conversations Project. They had been working on the abortion divide and differences for a long time. They had networks. And they reached out to six women, three of the most influential pro-life advocates um, and three of the most influential pro-choice pro advocates. And they said, would you consider, for a small period of time, sitting down with the other side and having a conversation for, the, for safety, right? For the you know, possibility of avoiding violence like this in the future. So they eventually agreed, these six women, and I have to say, they met in secret. So they agreed to meet for one month, four times. They met in secret in a church basement. They didn't tell anybody in their community that they were meeting with the other side because of the fear of violence, because of their own reputations professionally. They were meeting with the enemy. And the, the group of pro-life women went to a friendlies beforehand, and they prayed to God because they believed that they were sitting down with murderers and their souls would be tainted. They were afraid of each other. And they came together, facilitated, for several conversations, it was very hard, but eventually they came to agree to certain ways to communicate, not use kind of all the buzz terms, but really speak from the heart. And they stuck with this conversation. Um, they extended it past a, a month. They then continued and decided to go to the anniversary, which was one year. Ultimately, these women all leaders in these different movements at a macro level met in secret for over five years in a basement. And then in 2001, 
they came out publicly in the Boston Globe with an article called Talking with the Enemy. And they all were signatures on it. And they talked about their experience. And one of the most important things that came from that, a lot came from that. By the way, this was 25 years ago. These women, most of them retired, are still friends today. Mm -hmm. Even though in these conversations, their attitudes and opinions became more extreme, but their friendships became deep. They really came to respect and love and appreciate. They talked about affection and love for each other. And they're still friends. But what part of what happened as an as a, um, a artifact of that is that they changed their activism. They started to take responsibility for the fact that how they did their activism contributed to stochastic terrorism, created the conditions where the probability of that kind of violence was high. And they said, we can't do that anymore. We have to be responsible for that. That is critical. I, I will say, I know we, we're going to run out of time, but I met with a bipartisan working group in Congress this summer. This is six and six Republicans and Democrats who are trying to problem solve together, and they meet for breakfast once a month. They, to a person, are either, either have restraining orders against uh, citizens or are traveling with armed guards this, this, these days. Um, this is, a ser this is a different time for them. They are concerned. They're worried about this next election cycle, right? So some of them are not and are really reveling in it. The vast majority of them are taking this very seriously. And they're trying to do things like something called the Select Committee for the Modernization of Congress, which I encourage you all to read about. There's a piece in the Washington Post about it, um, which are really trying to change the culture of Congress. So there are leaders at all levels that are doing this kind of work that will change the culture. It will take time, and it takes courage and guts, because this is really hard work. Pierce, let me turn to you and see if you want to add any points. Yeah, and if you all are as moved as I am by that story of the pro-life and the pro-choice activists, highly recommend the new series called Abortion Talks. An awesome mother-son pair of filmmakers um, did that and are screening it now, and it, it's just so powerful. Mm -hmm. Also, while I have the mic and before we run out of time, I want to give you all uh, some other first steps you might take right after you spend the next month uh, doing the Polarization Detox Challenge, which I, which I cannot recommend highly enough. Follow, uh, in my uh, humble opinion, Listen First Coalition Partner starts with us, which is where that detox challenge is hosted on social media. They are putting out just some incredibly uplifting and empowering posts on overcoming extreme division. Also want to recommend resetting the tables film Purple, uh, which yeah. gives me a lot, of, a lot of hope and a really on the ground perspective on how this work can happen. You can start checking out our friends at All Sides who bring in news from across the spectrum, right, left, and center. I mentioned Living Room Conversations earlier as a charter member of the Listen First Coalition. They've got over 100 now topical conversation guides. So whatever that thing is that's top of mind for you, awesome resource to gather some folks together as you like. Certainly love for you to sign the Listen First Pledge. Simply, I will listen first to understand that I'll keep you in the loop with the movement. And to the point Peter just made about the bipartisan working group and the role of our elected officials, um, very proud of the work our partners at Common Ground Committee have done to create the Common Ground Scorecard, where you can check out how those elected officials are performing. Uh, in the ways we're describing here. Current leaders are Democratic Congresswoman Susie Lee, Republican Congressman Don Bacon, Democratic Congressman Dean Phillips. All of those score over 100. And knowing that you all are in New York was checking that out and impressed by a Republican Congressman Mike Lawler. This is a freshman um, who scores a 91. Also want to plug this coming Thursday at 7 on Zoom is going to be the first annual Bridge Building Innovation Showcase where there are going to be some awesome stories and, and, and champions of exactly what Peter described and people in their community looking to bridge these divides and solve problems. And then finally, out of all the tips, there's a whole bunch of them. I have my own set. But my favorite three that we can all start doing right now after this session is being a little bit more intentional about listening with curiosity speaking from our own experience and connecting with respect. And yeah, as we reflect on this after the session, I think we've all got to think about what to me is an urgent choice. Are we going to keep fighting our fellow Americans or are we going to fight for the country? And best book title ever, I swear to you, there is a way out of this toxic <laughs> division. And each one of us 
have got a powerful role to play right where we are. So let's do it. Pierce, thank you so much. Really, thank you so much. Let me ask one thing of you as you, when we end this session and you file out, is that um, turn to three or four people that are near you as you're leaving and introduce yourself, um, particularly people that you don't know. Introduce yourself, say hello. We need to do this more. We're not doing this enough. We're not finding ways to connect. Just take this opportunity as you, come, as you leave this thing to reach out to a few new people and just say hello, all right? Thank you for your time. Matthew, thank you. Pierce, thank you so much. Thank you for having me.